Okay, I believe we're live. The usual brief wait to make sure that everything reconnects correctly. Zoom even adds a little bit of extra delay, making sure that I, I wait for this to switch over and we'll wait just a second more to get everybody into the session, but it looks like everybody is into the session. So cool. All right. Welcome back in everyone to the second to last talk, the last block of, of the conference. Um, I was just, I was just saying, as we were, as we were getting all of, uh, we were getting connected, this was actually a sort of serendipitous, uh, uh, network block. So we've got our, 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 our third, our third talk, making use of, uh, drawing awesome insights from, from network analysis. Uh, this time though, this is another, another aspect of this work that I'm really excited to have in the conference. That is to say, another important connection that I think we need to be drawing is with the digital humanities more broadly, which is of course about studying more than just science. So now we're going to get to see a little bit about network analysis as it's applied to poetry. And I'm really excited to uh, really excited to hear this talk from our very own local uh, uh, Chris Tanisescu, with whom I've worked a bunch on a variety of other initiatives. And as you can see here, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to read out a, a number of co-authors, both at, uh, at UC Louvain here with us. Oh, you popped out of, uh, you popped out of, out of full screen mode. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, I just happened yeah. to notice it as I pop back over here to the other window. Um, both at, both at UC Louvain and at the University of Ottawa. So, uh, Let's see, hang on. Let me let me make sure that we get the get the video thing sorted. Yeah. You just, you just need to go up to play. Is that is it that simple? Or do you are you trying to get like presenter notes and stuff to work? No, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get back to play, but it's like uh, I, I needed to stop the, the video from the website because there was like a this clash, you know. Oh, oh, you had the other window open. I understand. Yeah, and, that, and now I, I don't know One how to those. get back to the to the <laughs> To the uh, maybe I should stop the, the the screen sharing and then share again and yeah that might be safer yeah 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 okay yes the infamous the infamous crowdcast feedback echo as we saw it the other day yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't want that all right please there we go that looks perfect take it away thanks. Thank you, Charles. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, it really feels good uh, to be part of this amazing, amazing conference. Uh, Heartiest congrats to, to the organizers and the presenters. Um, and indeed, uh, what a serendipitous, um, um, amazing coincidence, uh, quote unquote. Um, well, I will be like, you know, the, uh, the humble uh, follower of, of uh, my predecessors and, and this uh, meeting. Uh, and I'm also just a representative of a team of an international team. Uh, just like Charles said, uh, um, we have a couple of guys uh, working here at uh, UC Louvain and um, a few others at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Uh, and this is uh, part of a um, project titled uh, The Graph Poem. Uh, I will give a bit of a background uh, and then I will focus on uh, some of the uh, recent, uh, most recent, um, should I say advancements? We're, we're trying to, uh, to translate that into advancements um, uh, on you know, closeness and betweenness, betweenness centralities um, in multiplexes and their application in, in the poetry. Uh, so speaking of, of uh, the background and the, the concept of how this whole story started, um, it goes back um, over a decade. Um, the uh, the concept refers, I mean, uh, I hope the, uh, the name is pretty self-explanatory, kind of speaks for itself, right? Um, it goes, it, it refers to assembling networks of, uh, of poems um, in which the poems are the nodes and the edges are correlations between poems in various respects. And that's where the, the, the first difficulties uh, kicked in. 
but before getting there, uh, one thing at a time, um, what we adopted from the get-go was an asymptotically holistic approach. Well, asymptotically uh, kind of speaks for itself, of course. Holistic um, may sound a bit um, presumptuous, uh, but in our case means pragmatically um, tackling poetic features, um, you know, shooting for all poetic features, that's why asymptotically, uh, and then fully treating uh, poetic features. Um, and, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we're the only one um, ongoing project um, in the English speaking world, at least, um, undertaking to do that. Uh, while being aware that um, I already, as I already suggested, you know, um, all features is already something uh, that might sound presumptuous. But besides that, um, you know, poetic features, there are, you know, critically uh, debatable, questionable. Uh, there are so many uh, takes on um, meters to, to begin with, uh, can be, uh, you know, defined in so many ways. And there are so many approaches to meter, some of them completely different uh, from, you know, the, the, the classic, the established, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, acceptance of that. Uh, but, you know, this is something uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll get closer to uh, and deeper into um, during the Q&A. Um, but uh, we also uh, refer to the to our approach as being holistic in, in other respects as well, and particularly uh, in the sense of the intermediality of poems being embedded, embedded in the medium and in a wide, wider context in digital space. Again, something to be detailed, if not during the presentation per se, uh, later on. Um, and then, of course, now since we speak of features, plural, uh, of course, we, we will speak of multi-layer networks, networks in which every single layer will represent a feature, right? And since we speak of uh, corpora of poems, then we would expect, of course, to have the same nodes in each layer. So technically speaking, we'll be speaking of, we'll be dealing with multiplexes. Now, uh, for a brief history of, of this, very brief, but then, you know, on a personal level, when, uh, when I first came up with this idea, uh, uh, I came up with it from the standpoint of a poet myself um, and a professor of poetry and creative writing. Um, over a decade ago, I was a um, postdoctoral uh, fellow at San Diego State in California. Wow, yes, paradise. <laughs> Uh, going swimming, you know, going for a swim or uh, for a surf in late November. Um, and uh, well, it started with the, the poetic manifesto on um, legendary Jerome Rothenberg's uh, online journal slash blog, Poems and Poetics, uh, and then followed by a number of, uh, of other publications. Uh, like I said, from the standpoint of a, a practitioner myself, of, of, a, uh, of a poet myself, an academic in, in poetry and literature, but uh, nevertheless having a, a background in uh, mathematics and computer science. One of the, the milestones uh, of that stage was uh, an anthology, a manually uh, assembled graph poem, the first, uh, first attempt uh, at doing anything uh, you know, palpable, doing something palpable in that direction. Um, over 50 poets uh, from all over the world and various ages as well, under the collective name of Margento. Uh, that was, you know, the, the first book uh, um, in a line of publications uh, putting this concept into practice. Um, well, not for self-promotion only, uh, and I would hardly speak of self here since it's the whole team and uh, you know that's why uh, we've been using this umbrella term margento um, but for you know for the uh, for the sake of you know the kind of conversation uh, that uh, we started and you know the moment we got the ball rolling uh, the the kind of critical reception we got and uh, this is one of the uh, probably the, the the most significant ones from David Baker uh, 
the guy needs no further introduction, a uh, significant uh, major contemporary poet himself, also editor of, of Kenyan Review, and his enthusiastic reaction to, uh, to this initiative. Um, well, enthusiasm and, um, you know, uh, worm uh, reception aside, uh, what I can, you know, from, uh, if I were to be uh, the advocate of the devil here, uh, from this excerpt of what he wrote about uh, nomadosophy, the first graph poem book uh, coming out of this project, is that uh, he never mentions here, uh, and uh, not only in this excerpt, uh, that goes for, uh, for the whole piece, he never mentions the, uh, the fact that it's a graph theory based project, right? Uh, it might be um, communal, um, impressive, uh, initiative, um, very good poetry, uh, but where's the graph? Well, there is something still that uh, got in the picture, the performance side of it. And I will be uh, going back to that, but for now I wanna uh, also briefly uh, highlight the fact that uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm really glad that from the very inception, uh, people like David Baker, for instance, noticed the strong performative dimension of, uh, of the graph poem. And that actually goes uh, very intimately uh, connected with uh, the computational approach and the, uh, and the concept per se. So I would say the performativity is part of uh, the concept um, and generally speaking uh, of uh, any approach that would consider applying uh, network science or graph theory, uh, in poetry. More about that uh, in a bit. Uh, well, and these are some uh, exemplifications in that direction. So Margento actually uh, uh, took off even before that, uh, uh, as early, uh, as a matter of fact, as 2001, as a, cross, uh, as a, as a performance cross art form uh, digital poetry project. Uh, Computational poetry would be uh, a better uh, term probably than digital poetry. Again, a discussion that we might, we, we could have later or you know, forget it for uh, even later on. Uh, but I'm just highlighting a, a couple of events. Uh, uh, we actually uh, did such events you know, in Europe, uh, in North America, in Vietnam, in Australia, uh, you name it. Uh, I'm just, you know, highlighting again uh, one of the uh, a couple of, of milestones. One of them was uh, the e poetry conference in uh, in London in 2013, and then the uh, the sequence of performances at DHSI uh, starting uh, back in 2019. So this year is going to be the third one, uh, and this is the year uh, 2021 when. Uh, the director, Ray Simmons, uh, preferred to use the term uh, the Institute Performance for, for this event. Um, this is just a, uh, a screenshot of the announcement and description of the event for uh, the upcoming edition, uh, June uh, 2021. Again, we can delve into details a bit later. And as part of the presentation, I'll have to go back to that in, uh, in certain respects. Well, uh, NLP classifiers, NLP, of course, natural language processing. Uh, speaking of uh, what Charles was, uh, was mentioning, you know, serendipity, serendipity before, uh, before uh, serendipity kicks in, uh, you have this like, you know, when you start and I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys, uh, I would expect uh, everybody uh, is on the same page uh, with me. Uh, we can share such experiences, right? You start a project and then you go like, well, but uh, what's your concept? Well, I want to organize poems uh, in networks uh, and represent poetry corpora as networks and then you know, use them for creative writing purposes, for teaching purposes and so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course it's like, oh, that sounds amazing. How are you going to articulate the networks? Well, of course we need some connections between the poems. Yes, okay, so what do we need uh, in order to be able to do that? What do we need to do? Well, we need some classifiers. And uh, that's, you know, uh, again, I think uh, 
you guys are on the same page with me when I say, well, you think of it as like, oh, I got to do this in order to do that. So maybe it's like a preliminary, something like, you know, I'll have to like sort out as fast as possible so that I can have fun with my network. Uh, well, it turns out uh, this, these preliminary things can go on for over a decade in this case, uh, like, you know, case in point, and they can actually, uh, and now I'm aware they will go, they will go on for, for a lifetime. Uh, but uh, enthusiastically, uh, you, know, you know, with a naivete of, of the beginner, I was like, oh, okay, let's put this in place. Let's uh, set this up. Uh, so I got a, uh, a grant in Canada, a SHRC. Uh, SHRC is like an acronym for Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council to exactly do that. Well, actually the, the, the grant was for like, you know, developing um, the graph poem, but in order to do that, yes, we need to develop NLP classifiers. So classifiers roll on. Uh, and that's uh, what we, we took, uh, you know, we took them one at a time and then we realized we'll have to go back <laughs> to uh, every single one of them. Uh, one at a time again, uh, then we realize, no, no, all of them at the same time, uh, but then we, we need to go back and then, oh, uh, was there left uh, that we never touched so far? Uh, so I uh, here, uh, I copy pasted a couple of uh, very short descriptions of, uh, of, of uh, work we've done so far. Um, we started with topic and subtopic and uh, this will of course inevitably um, here into a discussion on data uh, and of course the uh, uh, the keynotes today for instance among you know so many other brilliant uh, presentations uh, over these past four days uh, but the keynote today uh, definitely kicked it uh, out of the ballpark uh, we all know again I, I guess uh, well speaking for me and my team we definitely know what it means to like oh where's the data well, speaking of, for instance, this first classifier that we developed, well, Poetry Foundation is the English uh, language poetry online archive that is available for free and is manually annotated, uh, rigorously so, uh, and is there you know, up for grabs, uh, unlike, for instance, the ProQuest one. Um, we uh, did this. Uh, then we moved on to meter uh, and rhyme, well, scratching the surface of, of the first classifier, focused on you know basic meter in uh, in English, and of course when you uh, speak of that, you speak of uh, iambic, iambic pentameter, bien uh, sûr. You'll have to go there, um, and we also touch rhyme. First attempts were like you know just uh, very basic two classes only, we had to go back and uh, I will go back to that uh, in just a bit. Well, in the process, interestingly enough, and I know you guys know from experience again, well, you work on something and you serendipitously again, uh, stumble upon other things, right? Uh, or you have like, you know, illuminations. Uh, you, you can have, you know, um, all these uh, moments of uh, enlightenment, uh, enlightenment, when you go like, uh, oh, so while working on, focusedly on poetry, it turns out that, oh, uh, I can, you know, answer issues in other walks of life and particularly in NLP. And that's what happened to us. Uh, well, Joyce would call it epiphanies, right? Yeah, uh, we have this epiphany. Uh, well, it wasn't that mystical, uh, and in Joyce's ca case, also not that mystical. Uh, it was pretty much uh, mathematically explainable in the sense that, well, who did work in metaphor before? Well, people who didn't deal with, uh, in NLP, that is, people who didn't deal with literature. Well, when we combine data, uh, we notice that, that is poetry and non-poetry, and that's what I uh, answered here very briefly, we noticed that, uh, oh my God, uh, we can obtain better results than previously, that the results previously obtained uh, by people focusing strictly on non-poetry uh, data. 
So, but it also works better for us in poetry when we do this mix. Very interesting. Uh, well, that kind of uh, begged, uh, at least as far as I was concerned, begged for trying to make an argument in favor of poetry's relevance beyond the genre in digital humanities, well, in natural language processing and uh, in a wider context in uh, natural language processing. We took this to the next level. Uh, what's the next level? Well, we all know, deep learning. We did that in, in, uh, in matter for detection, uh, it turned out very well. And that again, made us stumble upon some more serendipitous again, um, at times incredible results. Like for instance, developing word embeddings that were better than glove. Well, who doesn't know about glove, right? Well, just training word embeddings on poetry data, amazingly so, outputted better results than, you know, training word embeddings on the usual kind of data. You know, the news data, we all know about that. Um, the, um, all those huge databases and, and corpora uh, that basically never include, uh, well, let alone poetry, but uh, you know, literature in general. Uh, unless you want to consider a very permissive, and I'm not against that, um, and that would be the first one, definitely not the first one to, uh, uh, to accept that. But the point is, when you focus on data that can be um, quote unquote universally acceptable, you know, considered to be poetry, and then you don't find it in data that is usually used, um, that is usually uh, fed to word embeddings, and then you mix the two, you train the word embeddings on, uh, embeddings on data that is labeled in terms of metadata and all that poetry and the word embeddings, and word embeddings are better, well, you definitely have a shot at making an argument in favor of poetry's relevance uh, in digital humanities, I would say. Well, next step was we uh, developed a black box. Uh, well, all of these classifiers, and I only mentioned uh, a couple of them, uh, diction is also there. Then we uh, kept refining the rhyme uh, Ryan, well, the, actually the, the, the more permissive, the more generous term would be euphony, of course, seven types of Ryan. Uh, and we got a forthcoming publication on that as well. Uh, we decided, well, we need to, to put all, this, you know, all these things together and make them available for the community to use. Uh, and we're in the process of um, making that available on the UOttawa uh, NLP lab server. One of the co-authors of uh, this paper, Diana Ingpen, a big name in uh, world-class name in uh, NLP. She's the director of um, the director of uh, the NLP lab at U Ottawa, which is not like saying, "Well, uh, she picks up the phone and calls somebody, and uh, our tools will be up on the server." No, it's not that easy. Uh, you guys again, I guess, know about this as the IT department, as the um, technical support staff and all that. Uh, well, we are in the process of, okay, so stay tuned, stay tuned. Well, this is just, you know, uh, the screenshot of um, the uh, Ryan classifier is run on local host. And um, we have, you can see here like the seven categories. Uh, you can get, uh, well, we, can, we fed, you know, the, the Poetry Foundation again, uh, archive of, uh, over 40,000 poems. Uh, and you can also click on two or three of them if you, if you also like to, to have the visualization. And this is like the, um, the illustration of uh, clicking uh, a three-dimensional visualization of uh, rhyme classification of a subcorpus of the corpus. Uh, and, but the, class, the classifier nevertheless, nevertheless works on all seven uh, categories. Finally, the graphs, right? I remember Diana, Diana Inkpen, uh, my co-applicant, University of Ottawa, the co-author of this presentation, of this paper. At a certain point, uh, 
she was telling one of the graduate students that we were supervising, um, was graduate student who was working on this, uh, and maybe we should finally get to doing some graphs since the name of our grant is the graph poem. Yes, well, we got to the graphs um, rather later than sooner. Uh, and I'm not yet sure we really got there, uh, but you know, it's in the name as, at least. Um, and one of the, uh, uh, of the first significant publications that, mm, that factually used uh, representing these corporized graphs as networks, right? Uh, was a computationally assembled anthology, US Poets, Foreign Poets back in 2018 I'll explain the, uh, the quotation marks that you see there um, wrapping the US in the title. Uh, well, to begin with, and um, very briefly, what it is that computationally assembled means. In the title, um, it means a, a number of things. Uh, well, first off, as uh, we can see here, uh, the translation of a, of a US poetry corpus into network graphs, that is the representation of, of that corpus. Well, the, the quotation mark, the quote unquote there, um, already uh, kick in at this level. Uh, US poetry, well, yes, but no. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, well, uh, we crossed the border of, uh, of digital and page-based, you know, the established, even if unfortunate terms, right? Um, page-based versus digital poetry. Uh, we can talk more about this uh, during the Q&A. Uh, we crossed that border, but we also crossed the border of US and uh, in the initial corpus, even if most of, of the poets were US poets, uh, we had exceptions like um, David Jave, Johnston, you know, Jave, a huge name in Canadian digital poetry. Uh, then John Cayley, uh, well, American, uh, American academic, right? Teaching at Brown, but also Canadian. Uh, and some would say, um, uh, one of the, if not the most important uh, contemporary digital poet, uh, practitioner and theorist, uh, but also uh, people like uh, Maria Mencia, who's an academic at Kingston University in London, but actually a Spaniard and so on and so forth. Uh, I will again, continue with what computational assembled meant in this particular case, and then go back to the, to the quote unquote uh, thing um, around US in the title. Uh, the first one I said were translating or representing uh, the initial corpus uh, as a graph. The second one uh, was assemblages that uh, would integrate subgenres like the already mentioned, mentioned uh, traditional slash page poetry and digital poetry or the uh, more general uh, genre electronic literature, right, feel it. Uh, thirdly, we did translations of algorithms that generated the originals uh, into algorithms for composing, generating, or assembling the translations, translations. Uh, well, some of, the, uh, some of these algorithmic translations uh, in the sense of translations of algorithms uh, were like, you know, accurately looking for equivalence, um, but others were like, you know, sticking in stuff. Uh, like for instance, I mentioned Maria Mencia, uh, her poem uh, contributed to the anthology, the poem that crossed the Atlantic. Uh, we took the, uh, it's an intermediate poetry, a uh, poem, sorry. We just grabbed the, uh, the prose description and wrote a, uh, an algorithm to translate that into uh, a double mesostick uh, in which the pillars, you know, uh, the axes uh, of the mesostick would be reading Mencia and Neruda because, you know, Pablo Neruda was a, po was, was a poet that appeared uh, significantly in, in her, um, it appears uh, significantly in, um, in her po digital poem. And also her grandfather who was a refugee uh, coming from Spain uh, and then France uh, to South America. Uh, so that was like, you know, sticking in an algorithm that would make sense of the poem, but like, you know, um, kind of taking it away from, completely from 
its initial uh, its initial location, while other uh, algorithms would would try to like replicate uh, one way or another originals into translations. And fourthly, uh, and perhaps most importantly for our discussion, um, we developed algorithms that would automatically expand the corpus. So the, the anthology itself was actually an anthology in progress in the sense that uh, there were algorithms um, outputting poems to be included on a uh, ongoing basis, on a permanent basis. And that opened the gates of the US in the title to like basically everybody uh, and any kind of, in every kind of, of, poet, of poetry, um, everybody, anybody, any kind of, of poems and of poetries uh, beyond any borders or boundaries. And that's where the US turned into us, you know, us poets everywhere and anywhere and in any other age, including uh, at a certain point, Babylonian uh, poets and their poems in English translation. Um, Christopher Pankhauser wrote about this anthology, again, not necessarily for uh, self-promotion here, uh, but for uh, an aspect that he uh, pointed out. Uh, that's why uh, just an excerpt here um, and not the whole uh, accolade. <laughs> uh, the one that uh, underlines the, uh, the, pros you know, the, the processual quality of the anthology and the, uh, the way in which it keeps generating uh, content out of itself and um, by searching automatically through other databases and archives, um, like I just mentioned. Uh, and on top of that, the, uh, the performative aspect of what we've uh, uh, tried to do there. That feeds again into the, uh, the topic of performance. And I, I hope I'll have, I'll get the chance to like look into what performance really means here besides the, uh, uh, the actual and the uh, established meaning of the, of the term, which is not to say that uh, we're not doing performance in the literal sense, but uh, the, uh, the concept that kind of uh, underlies uh, the, the graph poem initiative is a sort of um, translated acceptance of performance itself while uh, covering uh, performance in the uh, most literal sense of, of the word as well. And here we see uh, a couple of uh, screenshots of what happened in 2019 at DHSI. So there was a Jupyter Hub uh, with uh, some coding script going on, uh, participants having the possibility to run the code, but also contribute to the, to the corpus, uh, the initial corpus that we put together, we, Margento, uh, as the DHSI um, poem corpus. Uh, everybody had the opportunity to contribute to the, uh, to the corpus and run the code on Jupyter Hub. Uh, and the algorithm picked certain particular nodes out of the resulting um, networks and off of it uh, onto a, uh, to a bot on Twitter, uh, tweeting excerpts of, of those poems or, or texts and pairing them up with, uh, uh, with uh, creative work coming from our agenda videos, uh, audio files, uh, etc. Uh, which was kind of a surprise because you know, the event was uh, announced as a performance. And again, we're, I'm, I'm playing with this term, uh, but it turned out, well, and people were not mm, warned that, you know, the, what happened to what they contributed to that shared data and what the algorithm did was uh, being fed into a, a bot uh, that, and that was the performance. Well, for the 2020 uh, edition, well, while everybody knew, oh, so the performance is like in a uh, computational way of, you know, uh, an algorithmic way of uh, feeding some corpus into the bot, into a bot, 
well, the surprise was that it was uh, all the whole thing was also fed into a live stream on Facebook, and we can uh, uh, well go into de details about that as well later on. Yes, yes, Charles. I just wanted to ping you to say about ten minutes left in the session. Just wanted to make sure we had time for some yeah. for some discussion. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, destination multiplexes, first stop centralities. Multiplexes, like I said, uh, multi-layer networks, same nodes uh, in every single layer, but different layers. In our case, uh, layers representing poetic features. This is a, uh, an excerpt from the anthology, the, um, the computational assembled anthology I was mentioning, and another uh, instance of uh, serendipity uh, why centralities? Well, we are aware that, you know, you'll have um, pundits tell you uh, that, uh, well, centralities are maybe significant, but they don't really represent the whole network, right? They will tell you things about certain specific, spectacularly specific um, and uh, prominent nodes, but how about the, the whole corpus? Well, that's what happened to us while, while working on, uh, so it, it wasn't there in the in the beginning this this concept uh, well, or rather this this notion of focusing on centralities but what we noticed and i highlighted here was that certain poems in the initial corpus um the u.s corpus uh, were very low in closeness and very high in betweenness now uh, well in, in lay terms and i'm a layman myself uh poems that are really really marginal or actually incredibly effective connectors and we were like wow that's amazing how about we look deeper into this and then what we the kind of algorithm that we developed uh, was actually aiming at this at tracking down and including uh, in the expanded uh, in the ever expanding corpus poems that uh, would act out the same way be marginal but also uh, very strong connectors. Well, uh, now what I, what we did in the, in the developing that for the uh, the anthology that I mentioned was a a single layer network, and now we're moving on to multiplexes, uh, a multi layer network, a particular case of multi layer network. Uh, of a multi-layer network. And the, the way in which we developed the, the algorithm that uh, expanded the, the, uh, the, the corpus was based off of certain features of the diction of poems. Since we had a diction uh, classifier already and uh, developed in-house one, we were able to do that going through databases and archives uh, at hand, and again, uh, this, uh, there's, a, there's another tie-in with, with Keynote today, and not only, um, exactly where were those uh, resources and those archives and databases. Um, and we uh, selected poems to be added uh, on top of the already existing ones, and uh, that got the ball rolling and the, and the snowball effect uh, in that anthology. But now we were like, man, we got all these other classifiers, right? Uh, so now we had the means to the end, but we don't know how to deal with the end. In the beginning, you know, the NLP classifiers were like, oh, the preliminary stuff to finally get to the, to the graphs. Now we got to the graphs, but we're not able to deal with the graphs. Why? Because uh, the, uh, the literature available in computer science, and I'm, I'm not talking mathematics, uh, mathematics over the uh, past couple of decades, and particularly uh, in the past 15 years, uh, went sk skyrocketing in terms of you know detailing uh, concepts uh, and uh, implications of multi-layer networks. But computer science a bit lagging behind. So we're like we, we need to do the multi-layer network, uh, but we also need for our po graph poems. But we need to uh, contribute to applications of uh, multi-layer networks in computer science as well because there are no uh, effective, uh, no actual tools to do that. And here is a, a description of what we had to do, uh, computationally speaking, 
in order to uh, set that up. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the uh, we had the a component that would um, plug in the similarities between poems in different layers, and then uh, we had something that we could um, import uh, the network X library in Python that is usually that is usually and uh, you know establishedly used for single layer networks but uh, we uh, kind of managed to um, import it and like repurpose it uh, for uh, multiplexes uh, and here I'm, I'm detailing the ways in which mm, we uh, moved on like the very first step from a single layer network to a two layer network. Uh, and this second layer was the rhyme uh, layer. And I was like, you know, I was like rooting for that since, you know, the, the first approach looked into only into diction. And I was like, um, I was desperate for something that would account for formal features, right? And euphony is one of those, right? That would account for like uh, line breaks and uh, so many other uh, aspects and stresses and so on and so forth um, on top of diction, which could be, you know, um, as pertinent or as relevant to other genres as well. Um, I, we mentioned here, uh, there's also, mm, there's actually um, something that was uh, copy pasted uh, in, in here from Nicola, Nicola Burney. Um, some of the upsides refer to uh, the low coupling and the modularity. We, we thought of this from the, uh, of it this way from the very beginning. We needed for it to be very modular because if we needed it for like, you know, uh, several layers of poetic features, then we were aware other people who like to use it might use it for, might need it to begin with where, for so different purposes and for such different kinds of, of data. Uh, well, for the, well, speaking of, of upsides now, downsides, of course, well, for the time being, it's just, you know, a couple of folders uh, on our Macs uh, that we shared between us. Uh, and uh, that's the way it goes, like, that's the way it goes, right? Uh, and, you know, issues like, you know, the Ryan classifier was written in Java, well, it took like, uh, it, will, it would take us for uh, like for ages to translate it into Python, but we wrote an adapter so that we were, uh, were able to tap into uh, the Java classifier that was written by um, one of the co-authors of this paper, uh, Vaibhav Kesarwani. Uh, we wrote the, uh, the adapter to tap into that and then plug it uh, back in, in into our framework in Python. Well, it's just a screenshot of how it works uh, on uh, VS Studio. I usually use uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you know, for a number of reasons that I don't want to go into right now. But, you know, uh, speaking of things that uh, can go crazy, uh, in this particular case, just simply didn't work on Jupyter and um, it did work on uh, VS Studio. Uh, well, this is part of, uh, again, um, maybe for the Q&A, uh, of the way in which we look at uh, performance in digital space and uh, the uh, what we what we termed in uh, previous publication a poetic technologies right the networks go so much deeper than the uh, po the poem corpora right uh, and the networked routines and uh, ways of writing uh, are there basically everywhere in the medium and in digital space. Uh, more widely, and this is one of the uh, uh, one of the examples of uh, of that. And who can possibly know uh, for real why and how? Well, it works on VS Code. Uh, well, a couple of uh, of um, closing notes, if you will, on on this. Uh, from a, um, I wouldn't call it a philosophical, particularly not in this context of, of this conference, I'm no philosopher, uh, but, you know, kind of, you know, speculative considerations of what's happening here with the 
with this project. And these kinds of, uh, of transitions from you know, single layer to uh, multiplexes from a certain corpus to an expanded corpus, uh, what happens to from certain kind of data that in this approach, uh, you would say the same data, but you know, uh, as long as we worked um, with it on and on it on a single layer basis, uh, it was this kind of data and this data, and but that or plural, plural, right? These data, and then uh, the moment we added another layer, oh my God, these are different data. Uh, we can, you know, um, and the the full paper uh, will include like uh, comparisons between. Um, the positions of, of, of nodes, right? Uh, that I mentioned before, what happened to them when we, layer, when we added another layer, right? And then if the uh, initial corpus was the US, us actually, was expanded in, in a certain direction while looking into diction, now that we're looking into diction and sound, um, are we expanding it the same way? Definitely not. What happened to all these collections of data uh, that are, uh, and we developed a um, quote unquote philosophy on this, and we, we got a publication uh, forthcoming on that as well. Um, all these multiverses of, uh, of poetic data, they go where all these constellations, we look at them as documents of performances of the graph poem as being inscribed in the digital space. Uh, multiverses, if you will. Um, these are my references. Uh, it's just uh, just a brief list. Uh, there are so many more. Um, and uh, I'll stop here for now. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Fantastic. Thanks so much. We don't have too much time for Q&A, but let's, let's get in what we can. So uh, I wanted to, I'm going to do my usual and start with one for me while we wait for, wait for more people to, to, to chime in. Um, really cool stuff. I'm really excited. I hadn't, I hadn't seen the newest stuff on the classifiers. I don't think this is a really, this is looking really, really cool. Um, one thing that I wanted to grab onto, it's a bit more speculative, but I'm going to go there anyway. Um, something that seemed to come up at multiple points in your talk was this idea of, uh, and this actually, it's been a bit of an undercurrent throughout the conference, this idea of these digital analyses as sort of making the unexpected visible, right? Teaching you stuff that you, getting things out that you didn't put in, rendering, rendering visible stuff that you never thought you'd be able to see. And I wonder what that, uh, can you, can, Tell me briefly what that what that's meant for you and, and how you engage with that in your in your research process. Yes, well, yes, I noticed that in the, yeah, you're right. It's been like, you know, uh, an undercurrent of, of, uh, of this fantastic conference. And it's fantastic for this reason as well. Uh, the people, you know, being honest about this and like, you know, keeping an open mind, right? It's not like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm omniscient. Uh, and I knew everything from the beginning. No, I, I, uh, for me as a poet is a blessing. It's like, you know, doing experimental poetry. That's and the way, I, and I see that's the way of doing experimental poetry nowadays, writing algorithms and learning from them things that you never saw before. And, you know, uh, you called it very correctly, serendipity. Um, I also mentioned like, you know, preliminary stuff that gets permanent and provisional things that become obsessive and so on and so forth. In Romanian, since I'm of Romanian origin, we have this uh, unique term, intemplare. Uh, it would be like you know, from Latin, in templare. Uh, it's unique among Roman languages. And it would be like translated, it would be like, what, what is in the temple? But in the temple, like, you know, when you, you're doing like, you know, we're trying to, to foretell the future, but it also looks like uh, um, haphazard and like totally unexpected, right? And the meaning in Romanian is that, I mean, the, uh, the etymology sounds very mystical, uh, be it pagan, of course, uh, and why not? Uh, but uh, the the the, uh, the connotations in Romanian are, are all that together. They like could be providential, but it could like be totally random. Uh, it could be like serendipitous, but it could be like also absurd. You know, and think of Ioannis Call and the, you know the, the strong absurdist tradition in Romanian letters. So I, I I'm looking at these from all these possible um, angles. 
I love it. Let me uh, let me unfortunately bring it to a wrap there. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, but if there are people who have more questions and comments, please feel free again via the Crowdcast chats are available after. So drop stuff, drop stuff in there and uh, and we'll see you guys at the next talk here in a few minutes. Thank you so much. This is fantastically cool. Thank stuff. you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.